Hey guys, six months ago I made the last video for our multiplayer roguelike survival game called The Last Path. Since then, we've created a procedural gun system that generates over 300,000 unique gun permutations. We completely revamped our world generation system. We added a merchant shop where you can buy and sell items. We added a new exploding enemy, a riot shield bandit, jumping, gibbing, defense points, UIFX, and tons more. For those of you who are new, The Last Path is a co-op FPS where you fight all sorts of enemies in an infinite and procedural world. The two of us developers are using the Unity game engine, Blender, and Substance Designer with absolutely no third-party assets. Eventually, we'll release the game on Steam, so if you want to add it to your wishlist to be notified upon its release, the link is in the description. Also, join our Discord community for daily updates. So now that you're up to speed, let's jump right in with our first topic, which is procedural gun generation. Like I said, we build a system that can generate over 300,000 unique gun permutations. These guns spawn randomly in chests throughout the world. When you find one of these guns in-game, you'll notice that the combination of the gun's parts determines its characteristics. For example, a gun with a drum magazine can hold more ammo than a gun with a regular mag, a gun with a tactical stock will be easier to handle than a gun without a stock, a gun with a quad barrel will shoot four bullets instead of one, a gun with a railgun barrel will shoot rails that penetrate multiple enemies and stick in their heads, this barrel shoots lasers that light up the night, and this shoots plasma balls. In its implementation, each part overrides a set of stats to find inscriptable objects. After our generation function assembles the parts, it chooses a rarity level for the gun. This rarity is reflected by the gun's skin, which is applied via a special color masking shader we made in Shader Graph. Now that the gun is fully assembled and skinned, we place it in front of a camera, dynamically adjust the camera's field of view to make sure that the gun is in frame, then extract and cache a render texture to use as this weapon's inventory icon. Above the inventory icon, you'll notice that each gun you find will have a special name, and I think it's kind of cool how we do this. When we generate the rarity level, it not only determines the skin pool, but also the stat bonuses that can generate on the gun. In this matrix that you see on screen, we align the gun's rarity with its most prevalent bonus, and this determines a special name for the weapon, descriptive of its qualities. And that pretty much wraps up the procedural guns. We're pretty big fans of generative techniques like this, which leads us to our next topic, which is world generation. Not so long ago, the environment was just repetitive. We just had a set of linear tiles with connection types on either side, and we would simply spawn in these tiles at random to fit the next connection type. This did succeed in creating an infinite world, but was very predictable, linear, and not so random feeling. Since then, we increased the granularity of randomness by reducing the size of the tiles themselves and also allowing for them to rotationally flip, mirror, turn, and change in elevation. In addition to those changes, you might also notice that we added procedural rock layers called strata. To visually achieve this, we first mapped a strata texture gradient to the world's Y axis, then a grayscale texture over the world by using the world's X and Z axes as the texture's U and V coordinates, and then we used the value of that grayscale texture to offset the base rock texture as well as the strata map vertically. This gives us a pretty realistic looking ravine. Within our newly textured ravine, apart from our regular random tiles, we also have special tiles which need to spawn on intervals like our merchant shop tile. But you can't just spawn in specific tiles on demand because they can only sit adjacent to tiles with certain connection types. To spawn in certain tiles on demand, you actually have to navigate a graph of compatible tiles ideally finding the shortest path to the one that you want to spawn. To implement this, I processed the results of a call to Dijkstra's algorithm. Here I pass in our tile adjacency matrix and compute a dictionary that maps each endpoint type to the next tile permutation that would need to spawn in order to reach a target tile with the least transitions. This was actually pretty hard to figure out since you have to consider flipped tiles in the adjacency matrix as well, and also consider that you can't spawn interval tiles on the way to reach an interval tile. We do all this processing in Unity's onValidate callback, building a serialized dictionary that we can reference at runtime. This gives us more control over the gameplay loop and level layout, in the future allowing us to spawn boss tiles and biome transitions as needed. And like I said earlier, we also added tiles that can turn. But we did have to make some special consideration here, because if too many turn tiles spawn one after another, the world will actually intersect itself. To prevent this, we just compute the turn angle of each tile, and then ensure that the cumulative turn angle never surpasses a certain value. With all that environment design out of the way, it was pretty important that we started adding some gameplay changing level design within the tiles. As you might know, we have a deadly purple fog which forces you, the player, to constantly run forwards. But now, when you reach a gate, the fog will stop and wait for you to finish a small interaction. We added three gates, which we're calling defense points. A valve gate, which you have to hold on to open, a breakable wooden door, and a gate with a winch that you just have to press E on. 
As soon as you interact with any of these gates, you'll immediately hear a roar from the fog behind you, indicating that a wave of enemies has just spawned, and it's pretty tough to get past these gates while you're pressured from the hordes of enemies coming from the fog behind. Another piece of functional level design we added are the merchant shops, which are in fact interval tiles. Merchant shops currently spawn every few minutes or so, and when you walk inside, you're greeted with a wall of rare items from which you can purchase at a marked up price. You can also interact with the merchant himself to exchange your own items for cash. We decided to classify the merchant tiles as peaceful since the fog has to stop and wait for you to leave. Peaceful tiles will also respawn dead teammates. The game waits for the majority of your team to exit the merchant tile before the fog continues forward and the difficulty continues progressing. With this new in-game economy and these new cool interactions, it was time to work on some combat. We added several new enemies in the past few months. The first of which is the Exploder. As the name suggests, this enemy explodes as its primary attack, killing itself in the process. It will also explode if you shoot at its crystals, so you have to be careful. We also added a Riot Shield wielding bandit. This bandit holds a pistol and a large impenetrable shield. To kill this enemy, you'll typically want to shoot at its hand or through the small peephole up top. We're still wrapping up a third enemy too, which has some meaty arms made to throw crystals at you when he's not trying to flatten you into a pancake. And we didn't just make new enemies, but we also polished the original zombies. Inspired by Left 4 Dead, we added rotational leaning and predictive pathing. We also added some root motion attacks, using Unity's animation curves to tell the zombies how much that they can rotate towards their target over the duration of their attacks. Paired with a new upper body swinging attack blend, the crystal zombies now looked pretty good in action. Despite their new and improved visuals, the underlying hit detection code still performed one time sphere checks which felt pretty clunky and predictable. We improved this by adding a sphere trigger on the hand and then using the trigger callbacks to allow the zombie to hit several enemies over the duration of a single arm swing. Now the enemies were a lot better at hitting you but still felt greatly limited by their inability to navigate certain terrains. It would be boring to just fix this by limiting our level design, so instead we added a jumping mechanic which actually makes a function call to the knockback code from the last video after playing a small jumping animation. Enemies now looked and felt great, but they didn't make much noise. For this part, I programmed a voice line system for the NPCs so they can play voice lines to match their current behaviors, but also avoid overlapping with other enemies. The bandits can now talk and say some pretty funny things, and as a result, I think they feel a lot more alive. Damn. Now the next few topics are mainly visual enhancements and I won't go into too much detail. First we added gibbing, where each gib maps to a bone in the entity's skeleton. We reused this system for the breakable wooden gate since all of our entities with health inherit from a single script. And along with gibbing we also added blood splatter. Next we added smoke trails for bullets which fade up into the air nicely. I achieve this effect by placing line renderer points at the bullet's position each frame, and then subdividing between those points by distance. I then use a tweening API to move each point upwards and randomly while the alpha fades out to zero. I also want to show off our new chests, which are pretty fun to open and easier to locate. When you open these chests, you'll also gain a little bit of XP, which I made a nice little UI widget for. This widget is activated whenever you gain XP, including for kills, assists, and defense point completions. When you gain enough XP, you'll level up, which also increases your health. To indicate increases in health and level ups, we made a few more nice little UI animations, and we also pulse the chromatic aberration. If you're a fan of screen effects like that, then why don't you just go jump into a fire, take fog damage, or get shot at? We didn't know a great way to pull this off, so we made a screen space shader and shader graph and threw it onto a plane which we put in front of the main camera. When you're at low health, we'll also lower the saturation on your screen and fade in the sound of your player's heartbeat, which makes me a little bit uncomfortable. Everything must come to an end in life, so we added durability to your weapons too. Now your tools will break after a certain number of usages, forcing you to find another lucky permutation. And if you're interested, we created a nice little formula to work with durability, which uses the fire rate of your weapon to determine how fast it breaks. We also added player death, which shows you how long your run was, and if you're playing with friends, allows you to enter a spectator mode, which uses the same orbital camera that I made two years ago when we first started working on this game. And that brings us to the end of our second devlog for The Last Path. We don't really know how long it will be before we can release the game, but we work on it every single day, so join the Discord if you're interested in staying up to date as we have a lot planned. So thanks for watching, and we'll keep you updated.